small turnout, but you know we, we do what we can. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. We uh, uh, you're in for a really uh, wonderful experience. Um, one to I'll briefly, very briefly, because you told me very briefly introduce Esther. But I wanted to first of all. Um, Thank a couple of people. This is uh, sponsored by the Bristol Community College Holocaust Center. My name is Ron Weisberger. I'm the uh, coordinator of the center. Um, we want to thank the college, of course, for its support and, of course, we're using your facilities. And uh, we we do the you may have saw we do donations. All goes through our Bristol Community College Foundation. Um, thank anybody, those of you who did. Donate. We have many, um, this is the last program for this semester, but we have programming that we're planning for next year, perhaps the summer, but certainly next year. So lots to do. Um, I wanted to also thank the Jewish Federation of New Bedford, which has funded us, and uh, we really appreciate their funding. Um, also, the Jewish Federation of New Bedford Holocaust Committee, of which I'm a part, and which is really, we work very closely with them. And Cindy Oaken is over there, and Maria Reed, who's over there, you want to raise your hand? They're the co-directors co, uh, of the, or chairs of the committee, and they do a wonderful work in the uh, schools in this area. And the, um, they're having a program, what date? 26th. April 26th at the, um, it's Yom HaShoah, is the annual memorial for the Holocaust. And it's being held, first of all, in the park, Buttonwood Park, those of you who know that, at six o'clock, right? And then at the Temple Star of Israel at um, about seven o'clock. You may read about it, but anyway, uh, they do great work. Um, I also want to uh, welcome, I uh, co-teach, I'm very fortunate to co-teach, a course on the Holocaust with my colleague, Howard Tinberg, who's somewhere in this crowd, there he is. And our class is here, uh, and a part of this. And of course, they are very knowledgeable. They've been studying this, although uh, Howard and I, we say, we've been teaching the course for 12 years, and we're still novices. Uh, but they, they're learning, and Esther has, will be coming to our class. Our class goes around 6.30, so after this is over, Esther's going to come and speak to our class which is, uh, we really appreciate that. So anyway, yeah, those are the thank yous. I may have missed anybody else. Uh, but you came here to hear Esther. Um, I asked her, how should I introduce you? And she said, just as a survivor, because she has been, she was in Washington State last week, speaking to over a thousand people. She was in Iowa. She was in, uh, in New York State, other areas. She says, sometimes people introduce her and take half of her speech away. <laughs> so I won't do that. I'll just say we are very honored to have Esther Bauer here as our uh, Holocaust Center speaker uh, in honor of the Holocaust. And she has quite a story. So Esther. Can you hear me? Everybody? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, there are two things I want to say. First, um, I had an operation lately, and uh, from the anesthesia, my speech is a little affected, so you will have to excuse that. Also, my memory is not quite what it was, but I'm only 90, 91 years young. <laughs> The second one is, I can only tell you what happened to me personally. There are plenty of other stories, but I can only talk about myself. So I was born in Hamburg, Germany. Hamburg is a beautiful city. It has 2,300 bridges. It is a lot of water, and Americans always go to Munich, to Berchtesgaden, maybe Berlin. Nobody ever comes to Hamburg. Well, enough of this commercial for Hamburg. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my maiden name was Jonas, like the Jonas Brothers, but we are, <laughs> but we are not related. 
My father was the principal of the Jewish girls' school in Hamburg, 600 Jewish girls. My father was very orthodox. My mother was a medical doctor, and, um, I, um, and I had to go to my father's school, which I hated every day. To have a father and a mother in school is no good. Well, <laughs> I've never gone back to school either. <laughs> anyway, um, I, uh, my youth was the usual youth of a middle-class child. I had two girlfriends, non-Jewish girlfriends, uh, Eva and Hilde. And uh, I must say, they always talked to me, even after Hitler came. And uh, I met them after the war again. And we were friends till they both died, unfortunately. Well, uh, like I said, my father was the principal of the school. And uh, I had to go to his school. But first, no, my, my youth was uh, like any other child. I was roller skating on the street. And uh, like I said, I had these two girlfriends. And um, the neighbors were very nice. They greeted us very friendly. Then when I was nine years old, Hitler came to power. And my parents tried to shield me from everything, which was a big mistake. I had to hear things from other people. They would never talk to me about it. And things got progressively worse. Um, Jewish children were not allowed to go to public schools anymore. Jewish teachers were not allowed to teach anymore. Um, uh, Jewish doctors were not allowed to work as, as physicians anymore. My mother had to take care of uh, sick people at night. She had been a Red Cross nurse in World War I before she studied medicine. And there were soldiers already, German soldiers, who did not want to be taken care of by a Jewish nurse. So anti-Semitism goes way back in Germany. Well, um, like I said, things got progressively worse. We were, uh, 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 one morning I come to the park, I went through to go to the subway, and uh, there was a sign, Jews not allowed, and I had to make a big detour around that park where I had played all my childhood in, and the man in charge of it came to me and said, we are sorry, Miss Esther, but you cannot come here anymore. And then we had... Come for swimming. <coughs> it's coming. Uh, uh, we were not allowed to go swimming anymore. We were not allowed to go to concerts, to the opera, to movies. I loved the movies. We were not allowed to go anymore. And. Uh, uh, one day we were told we have to wear a Jewish star on our clothing, and not only on the clothing, but also on the door to the apartment. My baby nurse, who was not Jewish, uh, was very, very good to us till the very last day. She would come, even though she actually risked her life, if somebody saw a non-Jew going into a Jewish apartment, uh, something could have happened to her. But she came and brought us food. We were not allowed to go to regular stores anymore. There was a special store for Jews. And um, my father was strictly kosher. And uh, uh, he, of course, in 1935, I believe there was a law that you could not have kosher meat anymore. and. Later on, he allowed my mother and me to eat the non-kosher food, but he would not touch it. And um, then Jews had to take a Jewish name. Now, I, I was born Esther Sarah, and Sarah was one of the allowed Jewish names. Esther is Persian or Farsi and means star and is not, not a Jewish name. And um, 
uh, they had to pay to take either the name Sarah or Israel for men. Now, my father's name was Dr. Alberto Jonas, and he had to take the name Israel, so he became Dr. Alberto uh, Israel Jonas, which is very funny because Alberto, I have no idea how he got that name. His brother's name was Siegfried, which is as German as it comes. <coughs> But uh, I never found out why he was called Alberto. And um, yeah, well, things became progressively worse. Um, uh, on the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, you may have heard of it, uh, it was announced in the synagogues, you have to go back home now and bring your radios to the police station. And uh, my father said to my mother and me, you go, he wasn't going to do it. But before that, I have to tell you, we had a, um, a superintendent in my building where, where we lived, and uh, he would ring our doorbell and say very loud, is something wrong here again? And he closed the door, shook my father's hand, and they listened to Radio Luxembourg, which was anti-Nazi and together. And uh, he was really a very, very nice man and very much against the Nazis. Not every German was, was really for the Nazis, but they were unfortunately not enough. And um, one day we were told we have to leave our nice apartment and a German doctor wanted, wanted that apartment and we had to move to a so-called Jewish apartment. Uh, there was no hot water, there was no central heating, but my mother who had been in World War I knew how to, uh, how to heat a stove. My father and I couldn't have done it. My father always studied, and uh, uh, I don't think he really knew what was going on. He said he had done nothing wrong, nothing will happen to him, but he was completely wrong. He spoke five languages. My father spoke five languages, German, French, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, but not English. My mother spoke English perfectly. She had been an au pair in London uh, when she was a young girl. And my father said, uh, no, nah, I don't want to immigrate, but uh, uh, my mother would have loved to gone to Palestine at the time, but uh, uh, my father would not, would not allow it. And, um, well, then we, we lived in that uh, terrible apartment, but uh, we couldn't help it. And slowly, it's, uh, the transport started to, to go to Poland, to Czechoslovakia. Well, one day we were told, you are leaving on that and that day to Theresienstadt or Terezin in Czech. And we knew about Auschwitz. We knew everything about Auschwitz, but we didn't know about Terezin. And my father had to report to the Gestapo every week. And unfortunately, I say that this SS man was very nice to him. He didn't say, you miserable Jew. He said, Dr. Jonas, sit down and talk to him like a human being. And. Um, well, we were allowed to take one suitcase each and leave everything else behind. And uh, <clears throat> we were picked up uh, uh, by, a, by a truck and driven to a local station, uh, train station, station. And there was, I was 18, no, I have to go back, I'm sorry. I wasn't allowed to go to school after I was 15, ninth grade. That is the last class I, I was allowed to go to. 
And afterwards, I had to work in a factory. I did that for three years. I was forced labor. And um, it was uh, not terribly hard work, but uh, you had to be there five days a week. I don't think we worked on Saturdays and Sundays. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we come to the station, and there is this as, as man my father always had to see from the, you know what the Gestapo was, the uh, secret police, most of them, they're terrible. And he said to my father, I was 18 at the time, and I heard him say, don't worry, Dr. Jonas, you will have your school again. My father had to close the school in 1942, in May, I believe, and uh, uh, well, <laughs> the next day my father had to shovel coal and he was not a physically trained man and he died six weeks after we got to Terezin. But I have to tell you, we had to walk, uh, at that time was no train yet going into Terezin <laughs> and we had to walk and carry the heavy suitcases. My mother and I took the three suitcases. You can imagine how much stuff was in there, <coughs> being that we were only allowed one suitcase. So we walk into Terezin, and from one minute to the next, we were prisoners. Now, Terezin was a former uh, garrison town for the uh, Czech military. And there were smaller, there were big stone barracks, four-sided, with a courtyard in the middle where there was only stone on the courtyard, and uh, and there were smaller houses where the uh, business people lived. So here we we go into the courtyard of one of these stone barracks. And we were told to put our suitcases down. We would get them later. Needless to say, we never saw them again. And everybody in Terezin now was Jewish. And we walk by the kitchen, and there stands a young man and looks at me. I was 18 years old, and I assume not too bad looking. <laughs> so uh, I knew he would come after me. And, <laughs> We went up to the attic on the third floor, stone floor, dirty, no beds, no mattresses, no chairs, no tables. <coughs> Sorry, nothing, nothing, nothing. We were 750 people from Hamburg, Jews, of course, and men, women and children together. And the worst part were the latrines. There were wooden slats and men, women, children together. It was just awful. And we lived on the stone floor without anything, just the clothes on our bodies. And maybe we had a little bit on our handbags, but that was all. And uh, <clears throat> Well, this young man comes, doesn't speak a word of German. I don't speak a word of Czech. Well, he got some people to interpret for us. And uh, uh, I made up my mind, I'm going to learn the language, which I laid, later did. Now, this man saved my life. My father died, like I said, after six weeks. And I always said he died more of a broken heart than of the sickness, because that this Nazi had lied to him and told him he would have his school again. And <coughs> here he had to shovel coal. That was terrible. And uh, I got very sick. I got double pneumonia. And my mother was made a a doctor again in Terezin, but 
She had hardly any medicine, and he was able, his name was Honza, he was able to get me into a sick room where the, where the doctor had medicine, and I felt already better after a week or so, and I got high fever again, and Honza ran through the whole city, which wasn't allowed at the time. You could go to work, or, uh, but not, not like uh, just walk there. He really risked his life and found the doctor, brought her back, and she gave me an injection and said if she would have come uh, two hours later, I probably wouldn't be alive. So Honza saved my life. He was, there was a um, hierarchy in Teresin. The uh, Czech Jews who came first, mainly men, uh, could get the best jobs, the best rooms, and uh, uh, Honza was able to get my mother and me into a room where there were only five other women and not uh, where, where they have three beds above each other and uh, terrible conditions. And we also had a toilet with water, which was, of course, wonderful. And um, he was also able to steal some food from the kitchen in the evening. And my mother and me, we, we got food from him and uh, well, it, the food was terrible. When, when we came there, there were only rotten potatoes and uh, terrible a water soup and uh, just awful food. It became a little better later, but uh, it didn't really. And, uh, but he could uh, steal some bread, so my mother and I had a little extra bread at night and we weren't as hungry as some other people. And, um, well, he was also able to get me a job in the youth organization, which um, all uh, children under 18 lived in a, um, a children's home. And when the uh, transports came in and transports went out, that was the job of Terrazine mainly. And I had to write every child under 18, the name, birth date, where it came from, last address, but I had to write it with pencil because if that child was sent out later, probably to be killed in Auschwitz, uh, I had to erase that we only had so and so many cards and uh, then the next transport, I had to write uh, then the name of all children under 18. And uh, there was a former teacher who worked in that same office, and he taught me Czech. So I was able to talk to Hansa in his language because he wouldn't speak, he couldn't speak German. His mother, spoke perfect German, but wouldn't talk to me in German. So it was good that I could uh, speak Czech then. I worked there for two years, and uh, like I said, the, the, uh, uh, one of the terrors was that transports came out and transports went, uh, came in and transports went out. And um, one day, Honza gets uh, a notice that they need so and so many men to build up a new ghetto in uh, near Dresden, that is another German city. And uh, uh, we decided to get married. You could get married, but you couldn't live together. And. Uh, um, it was a justice of the peace who married us, and he said after the war we had to uh, renew the vows, uh, but we didn't care. So we got married, and three days later, Hansa left, uh, telling them that they were going to Dresden. Well, a few weeks later, 
the women of these men were told, you can go voluntarily after your husband. Well, I was married three days. I said, my mother was still alive, and uh, she said, stay here, stay here, don't go. I said, no, I have to go. I always do what my insights tell me. And to say goodbye to your mother is, of course, very hard, but I figured I'm going to be with Honza again. And we are sitting in the train, and I see Polish names, and I knew we were not going to Dresden, but to Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz, of course, is the worst and very hard to explain in a few words. Uh, we knew about the gas chambers, and um, uh, uh, well, we, we come to Auschwitz, and there stands that Dr. Mengele, you may have heard of his name, Joseph Mengele, with his dogs, and said, you go right, you go left. Well, he said to me, you go right, and my good friend who taught me Czech went to the left. And we come by barracks, and people came out and said, if you have any bread left or food left, throw it over, please, because uh, they will take it away from you. And the lady next to me, I didn't know her, uh, threw her bread over and was shot dead right next to me immediately when she did that. And I knew this is not a good place. Well, we come to the shower. They shaved off our hair. They took everything away from us. Not that we had much. As you know, we never got our suitcases in Terezin. And um, I had a watch yet from Hamburg, and I threw it on the floor because I didn't want the Nazis to get it that it was working. And we go into the shower, and I knew all about it, that gas may come, but water came. And uh, then they gave us very thin clothing. It was October in Poland. It was cold. And the Nazis were crazy about counting. They, we would stand. Uh, outside every morning for hours and hours and were counted and it rained on us and it, uh, it snowed on us. It was terrible and we had nothing, uh, nothing for the head. We just had clothing on the body and that was it. Well, uh, like I said, we had to, uh, we went into a barrack then and uh, there were 12 girls to one bed with wooden slats. And when you wanted to turn at night, uh, all 12 of us had to turn because there wasn't enough room. And uh, uh, there were no mattresses, no pillows, nothing, just the clothing we had on our... And at night, the people were taken out of other barracks and driven in small trucks to the gas chamber, and they knew where they were going, and they screamed, and I hear that screaming yet today. I mean, Auschwitz was just absolutely horrible. And after two weeks, we were told, you are going into the shower now. Well, we thought, that is the end. And we are in the shower and expected gas to come, but water came. And uh, again, we, we got very thin clothing. I got one pair of underpants, a summer dress, a very thin coat, wooden shoes, no socks, no stockings, no handkerchief, nothing, 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 nothing on the head. And we were put into a, a train and went back to Germany to build airplanes. This was in Freiburg in Saxony, near Dresden. <coughs> Needless to say, I didn't see Honza in Auschwitz. We were only in women's uh, uh, barracks. 
And um, here we come into a factory and it was wonderfully warm and they had uh, wooden beds with a straw sack and uh, at, when we lay down at night, always two girls to one bed and I asked the lady next to me, I mean I knew some other people but they were not near me, do you want to share the bed? Yes, okay. She was from Czechoslovakia and uh, we lay down and the bed bugs and the fleas and the lice. It was horrible. Today, if you itch, you go to a drugstore and buy a cream or something. We had absolutely <coughs> nothing. We had no <coughs> toothbrush, we had no toothpaste, we had no soap, we had no towel. We had nothing, 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 just what we had on our body. And uh, uh, we worked uh, building airplanes at the time. Uh, you had uh, an air hammer and a piece of iron and we had to go into the steam every hour to get um, rivets. And there stood the SS man in charge of that camp and he beat us with his leather belt. It, it was a horrible situation. The work itself wasn't too bad and the only act of sabotage I was able to do is make the rivets too short or too long and they couldn't check that because that whole piece was closed. And uh, I say no plane that I ever built will fly. <laughs> So we were there nine months and uh, it got already to the point where uh, no more raw material came in and they gave us pieces of aluminum and we had to stand there and, and, uh, file. and file this. And uh, so the Nazis who came to check on us would see that we were working but we didn't accomplish anything anymore. <laughs> but, I was able to make myself a comb and uh, <clears throat> I still have this comb in my uh, safe deposit box in New York and uh, because after nine months the, uh, the hair had grown and uh, one day we were told well you uh, yeah and we were so terribly hungry by the way they built us barracks outside the city of Freiburg and in the morning we had to march in and uh, we grabbed the grass to eat because we were so terribly hungry. We got one slice of bread in the morning that had to last you all day. You got one cup of ersatz coffee that was coffee made from some grain. Uh, we got a watery soup for lunch and a watery soup for dinner and we were terribly, terribly hungry. You talk hmm? about your foreman. Yeah, I had a very nice German elderly man as foreman who sometimes put a piece of bread in my station, which I appreciated very much. But I asked him to write to my baby nurse in Hamburg, but he wouldn't do that. So one day we were told, well, you go enter a train now and we figured, well, it goes back to Auschwitz. We didn't know that Auschwitz was already liberated in January and this was April 1945. So we go, these were open coal cars and you had just enough room for your behind to sit there and uh, <coughs> and uh, at night the train wouldn't uh, drive, it, it stood still somewhere and my friend Charlotte with whom I shared the bed uh, said to me, I'm going to flee tonight, come with me. I said no, the Czechs will know I'm German, the Germans will know I'm Jewish, it's a no-win situation, if they kill me, they kill me. You go, I'm not going. Well, she jumped 
and I heard shooting and I was sure that she was dead. Well, we go further and finally come to Mauthausen in Austria. Mauthausen was a terrible, terrible man's camp. It had a stone quarry and thousands were killed there. It also had a gas chamber. Uh, but they, nobody else had room for a thousand women. We were 500 Polish uh, uh, women out of Auschwitz and 400 Czechs and 100 German, all Jews. And we thousand were, by the way, we did not get a number in Auschwitz because we were either to be killed or uh, sent uh, out of Auschwitz again. So we were a thousand women without a number and many, some of my friends are still alive and we always show that we don't have a number. And well, why waste the ink? Yeah, why waste the ink on us? So, um, where am I? You on the train going out? Uh, yeah, we are going, uh, so we come to Mauthausen and uh, they had a barrack for us and um, I was very sick because we had, we, it would took about two weeks uh, to get from, uh, uh, from Freiburg to Mauthausen and um, we hadn't eaten very much and the guy who gave out the, the watery soup was a friend of my husband and he gave me right away two portions and if you haven't eaten in such a long time you cannot eat that much. So I got deathly sick. And one morning, I hear the people around me saying, the Nazis are all gone. I couldn't believe it, but they were gone. And uh, a, um, a tank, tank came up the, uh, the hill there with the white flag, and it was the Americans who liberated us. And that, of course, even though I was very sick, it was the happiest day of my life, you can imagine. Well, um, they nursed me back to health, and I went to the, I had uh, five years of English in school, but I wanted to learn American English, and I asked whether I may work in the office and, uh, and learn American English, and I did that. And I asked one soldier, where are you from? Uh, not that my geography was so good. And he said, I'm from Iowa. And I said, is that near Illinois? He said, yes. I said, I have an uncle, my uncle Siegfried, my father's only brother, who had, uh, was able to get to America in 1939. And, um, uh, I said, uh, can you find my uncle for me? He says, yes, I used to work for a newspaper, and he did find my uncle, and I got his address, and I could later write to him, and uh, uh, eventually he got me to America. The, the, the soldier from Hamburg? Yeah, the first American soldier I talked to said in the most beautiful Hamburg German to me, well, miss, where are you from? I said, from Hamburg. He says, so am I. He was a refugee who had come to New York in 38. And uh, yeah, I have to go back to, to the, I have to go back to uh, Freiburg. Not only were, were there Nazi uh, men, there were also Nazi women and uh, we had to, if we wanted to go to the bathroom, we had to stand at attention and ask, may I go? And if that bitch didn't want you to go. <laughs> we had to, 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 to be without uh, uh, all day. Anyway, uh, this uh, soldier who was from Hamburg, he was in the American army, and uh, 
he found one of those Nazi women and uh, he took a big suitcase and took everything she had, uh, put it in there, and I got a beautiful green suit with a, a black fur collar. I, I see that today, I wore it for years yet, and uh, uh, well, that was, I was very happy about it. Like I said, I, I always was lucky for some reason or other. So um, uh, one day, after a couple of weeks, the Russians took over the camp in Mauthausen, and many of us didn't want to stay with the Russians. We went to Linz, the next American occupied city, and in Linz, uh, we got an apartment. I don't remember how we paid for it, but I'm sure the Americans helped us. And in Germany and in Austria, you have to be registered at the police at all time. And I registered in that apartment. And then uh, I got myself a paying job. And, um, with the Americans? Uh, yeah, with the Americans in, in an office uh, of the Americans. And um, um, where am I? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, you needed ration cards to buy food. And I got a ration card, and I bought myself a Frankfurter on the street. And that was the best Frankfurter I ever <laughs> ate. <laughs> anyway, then yeah, then one day we decided to move to a DP camp. Do you know what that stands for? Displaced persons. There were not only Jews. There were other people who were in concentration camps, uh, anti-Nazis, and uh, and other people, and. Uh, I forgot to mention to the police that I had moved. And uh, one day, a former boyfriend of mine, who was half Jewish in Hamburg, who had been only six months in the camp, uh, heard that I was liberated in Mauthausen. And he again had a friend with a small truck, and they decided to get me out of uh, Austria. Well. They had to beg for ca gasoline. You couldn't buy gasoline uh, uh, the way you wanted because uh, at that time there was nothing to be had. So they went from American army posts from, to army posts and begged for gasoline. And they got enough to get to Austria. And they were told at the border, we give you 24 hours to find this girl. and. Um, uh, they found out that uh, Mauthausen was now in Russian hands, and my friend said, well, what would Esther do? She goes to the next American occupied city. And sure enough, that was Linz, and he comes to the police, and they give him the address of the apartment. But Esther doesn't live there anymore. This was a Saturday afternoon, and the stores were about to close, he had a picture of me, and he went with my picture from store to store and asked, do you know where this lady is? And one woman said, yes, she is uh, in the DP camp up the hill. Well, he goes to the DP camp. It's a Saturday afternoon. Esther is in the movies. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I always loved the movies. and. Uh, um, well, when I came back, there is my old friend Heinz. And uh, well, <clears throat> I went back with them to Hamburg, which wasn't easy either. We again had to beg for gasoline. And we finally made it back to Hamburg. And I wanted the apartment back where the Nazi had thrown us out of. And uh, uh, the British said, no, you can have one room in the apartment with that Nazi still in it. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and I moved to Bremen, 
which was the next American uh, occupied city. And uh, uh, from, I had written to my uncle in, in Peoria, Illinois, and he sent me an affidavit of support. So I came with the second boat uh, after the war. I was 22 to New York. My girlfriend, uh, uh, I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, she had found me in, in Germany with a, by letter, and she wrote to me, I can stay with her and her family as long as I wanted to if I come to New York. She picked me up from the boat. Well, in Hamburg, I must go back and say that I unfortunately found out that my mother was sent to Auschwitz and murdered, and so was my husband. So here I was all alone, and uh, I come to New York, and uh, she picks me up from the boat. We go home, and the mother made a wonderful dinner, and after dinner she said to me, and they were kosher, so you're not supposed to have anything, milk products, after you eat meat. And uh, uh, my girlfriend said, you want some ice cream? I said, yeah, I hadn't, had, <laughs> I hadn't had ice cream since I was a little girl. And uh, we, we went out to, at that time, at every corner on Broadway was an ice cream parlor. And we go in there, and I order my banana split or whatever it was, and it was wonderful. And in walked two young men. One was her boyfriend, of whom I know, didn't know yet, and uh, the other one was his buddy from the army. And the buddy asked me, are you the girl that just came from Germany? I said, yeah, this morning. He said, I pictured you quite differently. You don't have pigtails, no, I couldn't have had because they shaved it off in Auschwitz. And, uh, and you speak English, yes. And uh, I married him two years later. <laughs> and we were married 46 years. I have one son. I have one son who is 60 and two grandchildren. And I live now with my boy toy, Bill. <laughs> and I think that's as much as, uh, as I want to say, or... <laughs> or do you want anything else? If, um, I'm sure many of you may have uh, lots of uh, questions. We can have, you know, a few minutes yeah. of questions. So please um, speak up loud. Question? Yes. How did you deal with the everyday aspect of being hungry? How did you make it through the day? Well, the will to live is very strong. And, um, uh, about uh, living with the, with the experiences I made. I had to see a psychiatrist once many years ago in New York. Um, I had a sickness that was called psychosomatic. And uh, the first question was, do I have a guilt complex that uh, I was liberated and uh, six million were murdered. I said, no, I'm one of a thousand women and some of them are still alive. And, uh, and none of us was killed. I mean, people died because there was no medical help. And then the second session was, uh, do you think you need therapy? Now, this was already like uh, 10 or 20 years after I came to America. I may have uh, uh, I may have needed it in the beginning, but not then anymore. And he said, I want to tell you something. You lived in a shell. You let nothing touch you, and that is how you survived. Question, please. Um, in America, my understanding, I certainly wasn't here, there was for a long time a lot of denial of what was going on over there. 
and yet you said when you were in Hamburg in your apartment, you knew of Auschwitz and what was going on in, in your first concentration camp, you knew. How was that information, how did you, you know, a person like you know what was going on when around the world they claimed they didn't? I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. quite understand. He, he wanted you to know, how did, how did you find out about the concentration camps? Beforehand. Oh, a man had come back from Auschwitz, and that goes back to, oh, what year was it? Uh, uh, early 40s, and uh, he told us everything what happened in Auschwitz. Also in Terezin, there, there were people who did come back from Auschwitz, and uh, we knew everything. Over here? Okay, up there. Uh, Esther, uh, you shared with me that if you wrote a book, the title would have two words, a message. Would you uh, repeat those words? Yes. <clears throat> My message to all of you is you have to see to it that this never happens again. One of you may be president one day, and you have to see that uh, uh, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony, and he says, all men become brothers, and that's how the world should be. Unfortunately, it is not. But you have to see to it that this never happens again. want to know if you were ever angry at God. Yes. Uh, I am an, an atheist. I don't believe there is a God. Uh, I mean, we are supposed to be the chosen people, and six million of us were died, uh, were killed. Uh, where was God? I say he doesn't, he, she, it doesn't exist. He said the Germans were supposed to be good people. What made them support Hitler? I cannot answer that. <clears throat> I wonder myself, a country with Goethe and Schiller and Beethoven and Brahms and, uh, and Bach, how they could be like that is beyond me. I mean, there were many who did not really want to be Nazis, but they had to be in order to survive. Otherwise, they also would have been sent to, to a camp. Other questions? Okay, over there. I want, I want to tell you one story. I love classical music, and uh, I have a friend who is subscribed to the New York Philharmonic, and with her friend can't go, I buy the ticket. One day she called, so you want to go? I said, yes. I didn't even ask what the program was because they always smuggle a modern piece in the middle and you have to listen to this if you want to hear the last piece. <laughs> so it was Beethoven, Mozart, and a composer called Schnittke. I had never heard of Mr. Schnittke, nor did I like his music, but that's besides the point. <laughs> so one day uh, I called my hairdresser and it, uh, there are two Italian brothers who work together, don't talk to each other. They cut men, women, children, dogs, whatever has hair. <laughs> and uh, I said, Luigi, can I come this after? May I come this afternoon? He said, yeah, come at 3 p.m. So I walk in, he cuts a man's hair, and I hear the name Schnittke. Well, I said to myself, I have to mix myself in. And Bill would say, of course you had to mix yourself in. <laughs> and it turned out that he was in the same concert. He loved it. I didn't, except the classical ones. And uh, I said, well, he, uh, I, I looked up who he was. I said, he 
he was born in Russia of German parents. He studied in uh, Germany and he died in my hometown of Hamburg in 1998. So uh, uh, he said, oh, an American. I'm married to a woman from Stuttgart. That's another German city. I said, have you ever been to Stuttgart? He says, have I ever been? I drove my tank through there in 1945. Well, then I knew he was with the American army. I said, and I was liberated in Austria by the Americans. He jumps up and says, May 5, 1945, Mauthausen? I said, yes. Um. He said, I liberated you. Have you ever returned back to Germany? Oh, yes, I go all the time. We are going in May again. Um, you heard of the kinder transports, the children's uh, transports to, to England? Well, uh, did I say it before? My father took two transports uh, to England, and um, I wasn't allowed to go. I would take the place of another child. So I wound up in Auschwitz. But um, what did I want to say now? About returning to Germany. Uh, returning to Germany. There, uh, on the 6th of May, uh, a statue will be unveiled in Hamburg uh, for the children who went with the children's transport. And another one for the ones who did not, like me, and my name will be on there. And so we are going to Hamburg. But I also speak to a graduating class of policemen who probably never heard of the Holocaust. And uh, I, I'm scheduled in some schools in Hamburg. Uh, I always speak there, and it's always very well uh, taken, like, like here. And you go once a year? At least once a year, sometimes more. Um, Esther, I wonder when you read or you hear the news today with this, you know, ISIL and Boko Haram and all kinds, does it feel like it felt with the build up with the Nazis? Yes, absolutely. And when I met my second husband the first day, he asked me, will this ever happen again? I said, yes, definitely, maybe not in the same way, but it will be happen, and it looks like it now. So what do you think we can do to, to make it be, you know, you say never again, but it's already happening. What can we do to stop it? Yeah, I wish I knew. Unfortunately, Mr. Obama doesn't do much about it. But. <laughs> Uh, a couple, we have a room, time for a couple more questions. Maybe. I, I have one more story, oh, you may be interested. <laughs> in, in 1968, my husband came with a mail and said, you have a letter from a Charlotte Stein from Haifa. I said, that can't be, she is dead. That was my friend Charlotte with whom I uh, had to share the bed. And, uh, and she jumped over and I thought she was killed. But they didn't hit her, and the Czechs helped her to get back to her hometown, and she found her husband again also, and they went to that time Palestine, later Israel, and she played bridge with a teacher of the Jewish boys' school in Hamburg, the Talmud Torah school, and when she had heard Hamburg, she said, ah, oh, I had such a good friend from Hamburg, whatever happened to her? And he said, I'll get you her address. And then in 1970, we visited her. Unfortunately, she died in the meantime. Do we have any other? Uh, I know, I'm sure people have many other. Oh, question up there? Was it hard adjusting to life when you moved to New York? Was it hard to adjust to New York? Was it hard to adjust to New York? Not at all. I left New York the minute I. And, <laughs>
But the first thing I said, that people have it too good here. They don't know what it is to be so hungry that you eat the grass. And uh, uh, well, uh, I still say it now. We live in a senior residence and we have wonderful food. Uh, twice a day we get a meal, breakfast and dinner. And uh, people complain constantly, the soup is too hot, the soup is too cold. <laughs> uh, and it gets me so mad. It's like, the, the beef is too hard, uh, uh, the chicken doesn't taste so good. It's ridiculous, it's wonderful food. And, uh, and, uh, but there are always people who complain. They were never hungry. Yeah, they were never hungry, of course. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm sure this will be a, something that you won't forget very soon.